Hi everyone, my name is Paul Brugesen and today I'm going to be showing you the new Gaia Terrain Processor HDA that now ships as part of SideFX Labs. So, you may be wondering what is this node and why is it different uh, compared to what was released uh, quite a while ago. And that simply has to do with the fact that this is a replacement for the old Tor processor node, which you may have used in combination with Gaia 1. What this one allows you to do is work with Gaia 2. So what can you do with this node and why is it useful? So this node allows you, just like the old Tor processor, to build a network of nodes inside of Gaia and run that network as part of Houdini's compute graph for the subcontext. It allows you to bind parameters that you can expose as well as in an output. For this node to work, just like the old Tor processor, you need to make sure that the height field that you feed into it has a power of two resolution and has a square aspect ratio, which in this case means that I have a 2K by 2K terrain. I can also use, for example, a 1K by 1K terrain or a 4K or 8K or 16K terrain. Uh, those are all supported, but they do need to be square. Okay. So to get started with this, how do we actually get this to work? Well, it's fairly simple. We simply open up Gaia and we need to make sure that we're using Gaia 2.2.0.0 with a licensed version of professional or enterprise. Now for this to work, it's fairly straightforward. We need to drop down an input node, in this case, a file node, and this allows us to bind an input coming from Houdini to the processing that happens inside of Gaia. So in this case, our very simple erosion example, the only thing that we're really interested in for now is the height. So we just need one input. Then of course, we need to create an erosion node because that's the actual process that we want to bring into Houdini. But it could of course also be a combination of several nodes, whatever you feel like doing. So we're going to wire this node into the input of the erosion node. And as we can see, the erosion node gives us four outputs that we're able to bind. And to do that, I'm just going to create an export node and I'm going to wire that into my outputs. Now important for an export node is that you configure it correctly. And you can do that by going into the um, parameter dialog and clicking on Gaia raw for the export file format and specifying that the location has to be explicit. Okay. And so that gives us the ability to bind the output path as a variable or parameter inside of Houdini. And so to do that, what I'm going to do is click this little icon to the right of the parameter and just specify that I want to bind to a new variable. And as we can see, it now shows up here in our variable tab in Gaia named output path. Now we of course need to do the same thing for our input node. So I'm going to click that node and just like before on the file parameter, all the way to the right, click this little icon and specify that I want to bind this to a new variable. And as you can see, it's got starting to get a bit confusing what these are. So what we can do is if this mode isn't enabled for you yet, click the little pencil icon here, which allows you to modify these parameters. So since I know that file name is my height, I'm going to right click it and specify edit. And I'm going to just name it in height, just like that. You can name it whatever it is you like. Uh, this is purely a personal preference, but what I like doing is just specifying that I'm either using it as an input or an output, so it's easy for me to understand what's happening, and then afterwards the layer name that I intend to bind. Again, purely personal preference. Then for the input, we need to make sure that our string type is set to be input, so that Houdini actually knows that this is an input parameter. And we're going to do the same thing for our output. So I'm just going to edit that. And then here, I'm just going to call it out height because I know that I've bound it to my height parameter. For string type on output parameters or output bindings, we need to make sure that we specify output and just click accept change. And now what I like doing is making sure that all my input nodes are in front of the output nodes 
because this will uh, change how these two are ordered and I like input to be above output, which once again, personal preference, but uh, may help your peers if they are working with you. And then I'm going to repeat that process for all the three other channels, just like that. Okay, and just like that, we have now bound our four export nodes to be Gaia raw files being saved to disk with an explicit path and our output path being bound to a variable here. Okay, now of course, we don't just want an input and output, we also want to do something more exciting. For example, binding these input or parameters on the erosion node. And we can just simply repeat the same process we did before by just right clicking this little icon to the right of the parameter and specifying bind to. So let's do that. Let's bind a couple of different parameters. Just like that, we've bound four parameters. And now what we need to do in order to use this in Houdini is save this file to disk, of course. And what we do is we just do save as, and I'm going to save it to this folder that I have already pre-created for this video tutorial. And we're just going to call it my example hit save, and it is now saved to disk. Inside of Houdini, we now of course create our Gaia terrain processor, right, which is this uh, node. We're going to wire it into our input, once again, making sure that it is a one-to-one -one aspect ratio and that it has a power of two resolution, which in my prepared example, it already is and has. So we're going to select this node and specify that we want to use our my example.terrain file on disk that we just created, as you can see. Now, our parameters are not yet here. So what do we need to do to actually make those show up? Well, that's an easy question to answer. We press the button that says generate parameters. And once we do, we can see that we now have our four bound parameters from the erosion node, as well as our input and output bindings. So to start using this, what I'm going to do is click my display flag on here, which will throw an error. And it will specify the layer bindings for this node are not specified. And that is because these bindings do not yet have a value. So let's make sure that we actually provide those. And height is a volume that our node or input node already had, but the flow where and deposit are new volumes that this node needs to create. And the only thing we need to do is simply specify the name that we want those to have. Once again, you're able to name this whatever it is you want. These are purely uh, decorative or informative. And you can see that we still get an error. So let's look at the error and check what's going on. It says here, file not found error. The node cache is either invalid or missing. Please recook this node. And you may be wondering, why is my cache invalid? Because I've, I have my parameters, I have my bindings. What's going on? Well, that is because of how this node works. The node works by communicating between Gaia and Houdini by saving files to disk. And it does that in this cache directory, which if we go to here and we look at it in our file browser, we can see that we have some um, old files here, which we don't need. So I'm just going to delete those, which means that, yeah, our node doesn't actually have any cache files here. As soon as I press cook, we can see that now in that folder, our cache actually exists, right? For render Gaia terrain processor three, which is the name of this node as expected. If we change our parameters on this node, we can see that nothing is actually happening yet. And that is because we once again need to either press cook, which will update the actual cache that lives on disk, this one here, or we need to enable auto cook. And as soon as we do that, and we change, for example, the seed, we can see that our terrain updates live as soon as we either change um, any of the parameters here, or as soon as we change, for example, uh, some upstream data in our network. And so the reason why this auto cook toggle is useful is in the case that you, for example, don't have Gaia installed on your machine and someone else uses this file, 
the node is still able to load the cache that lives on disk, right? Which means that it is able to use it. It simply won't be able to generate new uh, updated versions based on parameter values. Okay, so that was a very simple example. Now I want to show you something more exciting, and that is how you can use, for example, color in your graph. And so if we look at the sample that was already provided, you can see that uh, I already have a simple erosion dot terrain, which is a bit more complex than what we already have. But when we middle click on this node, um, we can see that uh, it actually has float um, volumes called color.r, color.g, and color.b, which correspond to this channel that we had it create for color. But we don't actually see the color. And the question is, why don't we actually see this color? And that has to do with how Houdini uses um, color in the viewport for volumes at the time of recording. For example, if we use a draw mask, we can see that the terrain colors red. Now, this is the exact same um, system used that we are using for visualizing color of uh, the files coming from Gaia. So why can we see mask but not our color? Well, that has to do with how the visualizer that is attached to our node interprets the data on the volume. And so to work around that, what we've done is we've shipped this node called Gaia Terrain Color Visualizer, which allows you to switch between the mode of volumes where you use a mask, right, which allows you to see masks, or where you're able to see the color of a terrain node coming from Gaia. And you can see that with this visualize dropdown, we can specify we either want to see terrain color, where we're able to provide which channels we want to visualize, or that we want to see the regular mask, which when we plug in our mask node, we can see it shows up and disappears. And if we toggle between those, we can see that we either have our mask or we have our color. So use this to your advantage and whenever you need it, but please remember that you can either see color or a mask never at the same time. Unless, of course, you make mask part of the color channel, for example. But this is not a super exciting example yet. A uh, more exciting example, which is something new in Gaia, is uh, something called color erosion, which allows you to erode color as we saw before. So this boring color sample that we saw here, if we feed that into the node again, we can see that it nicely erodes it. So how do we actually do that? Well, let's open up Gaia and let's look at the sample for that, my color erosion. And you can see in this prepared example that I've once again used two file nodes. We have this one here and we have this one here. This one's bound to the input color and this one's bound to the input height. Inside of Gaia, we then use the color erosion node in which we export the color that we've now eroded to disk again. And so how is Houdini actually able to import color as volumes? As before, this node here, or this output binding, we specify what the layer name is that we want to use, for example, my color. And then once the node cooks, we can see that it creates three volumes. It creates mycolor.r, mycolor.g, and mycolor.b, which when we copy this to our terrain color visualizer, we need to make sure that we also change these names here to be the name of the layer that we specified. In this case, mycolor.r, mycolor.b, uh, g, and mycolor.b. Okay, so that's uh, how you can do colors. Specifying colors as an input is uh, working the same way. Instead of specifying you only want to feed in color, you of course need to tell it that you want to specify and feed as an input color.r, color.g and color.b. Okay, so that's just a little gotcha that you need to be aware of. So moving on to an example that's a bit more complex where we put PDG as part of the loop. And so to use PDG with a node, there's two things you need to be aware of. The first one being the cache that we save to disk, because as you can imagine, Every time we process something with PDG in this node, the node is going to save some data to disk, to the cache. But if every work item specifies an, uh, the same data, 
to be used for the cache location, every work item is going to be overwriting the same cache. So to work around that, what you can do is in the extra data parameter, you can specify what you want the name of the cache to be that's being saved in the cache directory. So for PDG, something useful is either using at PDG underscore name, or for example, a attribute that lives on the work item that you already know is going to be unique per work item. So in this case, we can see here, as soon as we go into our uh, PDG example and we generate the node, let's save that, and we click one of these work items, we can now see that on the node, the at PDG underscore name evaluates to the name of the work item that's currently being processed. Now, there is one more thing that we need to be aware of when using PDG with Gaia, and that is that we can only ever cook one instance of the Gaia Terrain processor at the same time per work item. So to work around that and to fix that, we need to click our local scheduler and we need to make sure that our scheduling option specifies that we're able to use only a single work item at the same time while cooking. Now in this example, I have of course specified single for the entire PDG network on the scheduler, but if you use it just in a single node as part of a larger PDG network, you can, for example, create a new scheduler or uh, add a job parameter, which is going to overwrite this checkbox just for the node that cooks uh, Gaia. Moving on to another example, the for each loop, the similar problem and solution applies. If we use it as part of a for each loop where this node is being recooked several times because it's being looped over, we also need to make sure that in the extra data, we specify some unique value per time that we go over this node and cook it. And so the most straightforward example is a for each loop where we have a fixed number of iterations, for example, five, and we create a metadata begin node where we can use the iteration attribute that the node will create, which is going to specify which iteration number it is currently processing over. And so what that will do is it will make sure that the cache name, when we generate this, let's do that again, that that cache is going to be unique for every iteration, which after we've cooked, let's look at it in the file browser. We can now see that indeed we have uh, in height iteration number zero, we have in height for iteration number one, in height for iteration number two, three, four, and so on. So that's just another little thing that you need to be aware of. But again, all of this is specified and explained in the uh, example file that we also ship as part of SideFX Labs. So that's it, um, enjoy. If you have any feedback for us, if you run into issues, please let Quad Spinner support know. Uh, we'd love to hear how you experience this plugin. Thank you and enjoy.